Welcome to Biology 2402 Lecture Series. This is now Chapter 19 on Blood. Now Chapter 19 and Chapter 20 and Chapter 21 are related. So Chapter 19 on Blood, Chapter 20 on Heart, and Chapter 21 on Blood Vessels are interconnected. We're going to start with this first slide of Chapter 19. In this slide, we see that the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood are related. Just as I mentioned that chapter 19, chapter 20, and chapter 21 are interconnected. So this slide is representing the same information. Next, we have the functions of blood. What does blood do? It transports materials from one place to another. It transports materials like oxygen and carbon dioxide, nutrients, hormones, our immune system, and even waste that we need to get rid of. Now, this line represents each of the functions in more detail. As we said, that they do transport. So blood does transport dissolved substances, such as ions, nutrients, those that we saw in the previous slide. Now, what do we have here? We have regulation of pH and ions. The blood pH is about 7.4. If your blood becomes too acidic or too basic, that results in things like acidosis and alkalosis. Then we have restriction of fluid loss. So we have a way of controlling blood flow within the body. Then we have defense against toxins and pathogens and that's our immune system that we spoke of. Then we have stabilization of blood temperature or body temperature. Remember we are warm-blooded animals and we need to be able to maintain our heat by way of restricting or inducing the loss of body heat. Now, whole blood, which is made up of two main compartments, plasma and formed elements. Now, plasma is primarily water. Likewise, we have dissolved plasma proteins, such as fibrinogen, such as albumin. Now it is very noteworthy to notice that albumin will play a role later in blood pressure. Then we have other solutes such as ions, electrolytes, things of that sort fall under this category. The rule of thumb to remember is that if it is a chemical then it belongs to the plasma category. If it is a cell, then it belongs to formed elements. And the hint is down here as well. So cells belong to formed elements. Chemicals belong to the plasma. Now on page 640 and 641, you're going to see a template opened up that shows you the, the whole blood broken down into plasma and formed elements. It is important to have a general feel for the percentages shown on page 640's picture. Likewise, on page 641, they've expanded the plasma section and shown you that things like albumin, fibrinogen, globulins, which are also called your antibodies or immunoglobins. Then we have our organics, such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins. They all belong to this category. Then we have our electrolytes, basically our ions, and then our waste, like urea. So page 641, the top portion regarding plasma. That is an important picture to keep in mind. Now, of course, what is the largest component of plasma? Water. Then on the bottom of page 641, they talk about the formed elements. The first one listed there are platelets. Platelets are your clotting factors going with the clotting. So we're going to see platelets and thrombocytes and words like that later. Then we have our white blood cells. 
often called leukocytes. And they are neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. And these are actually broken down into two categories. The granulocytes, which are neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, and the agranulocytes, which are lymphocytes and monocytes. And we'll see them in more detail later. Then the biggest component of formed elements is your red blood cell. So they make up a big chunk. And your book mentions on page 640, 99.9%. .9%. So the biggest chunk of your formed elements will come from red blood cells. Now also on page 640, they give you the information about hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood. Not number, but percentage. So hematocrit is the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood. The general rule to keep in mind about numbers is that men have a higher value than women. So the hematocrit, for example, in men is higher than that of women. Roughly the hematocrit is about 45% of whole blood, typically. Now yes, that number is important because if the blood becomes more red blood cells, meaning for some reason you have more red blood cell production, then yes, you're going to have a higher hematocrit. And that would mean that your blood is more like a thick molasses. And therefore that does affect chapter 20 on the heart. So yes, hematocrit will have a value in chapter 20 in the heart chapter. Now, the next thing we see is this diagram. This is what I mentioned a moment ago about formed elements. Formed elements are your red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells, part of the immune system, and the platelets which I mentioned go with your clotting or your thrombocytes. So that is an important tool to keep in mind. Next, we have the general characteristics of blood. I already mentioned that blood is slightly alkaline. Notice the number I gave of 7.4, which is the midline. Your blood is also highly viscous. It is thick. And, of course, your body temperatures me measured or maintained by your blood. So your blood is pretty warm, and that's why you stay warm. If you actually cool down the periphery blood vessels, like the ones on your skin, then you cool down, and that's how that works. Next, we have characteristics of blood on this slide. Now, I do not care about the percentage shown here, but I do want you to keep in mind what I said earlier. Men have more than females. The number we are going to go with typically is 5 liters on average. So we have 5 liters of blood moving around. Now it does say here it accounts for about 7% of body weight. That's a rough estimate to keep in mind. But again, 5 liters, men have more, women have less. Okay, now let's continue. What is found in plasma? As we said earlier, that plasma is made up of mostly water. More than 90% of plasma is water. Now instead of writing all of this, there was a shortcut I gave a moment ago, and that is that plasma is primarily going to consist of things such as chemicals, ions, water, solids. Again, don't forget the list that was on page 641. Now, I have already mentioned these also. These are the things that are found in plasma proteins. We have albumins, which I said is playing a role later in blood pressure. You have your globulins. Your globulins are going to be your immunoglobins, which are part of your immune system. And then we have fibrinogen, which is going to play a role in blood clotting. Again, very important to keep that in mind. I'm going to pass up this slide because I've already given you the overview that goes with it. Now comes serum. This is an important definition. What is serum? 
serum is basically this, in which dissolved fibrogen, fibrinogen has converted to solid fibrin. So serum is everything that was found in plasma minus the clotting factors. So your author has a nice definition on that, of what serum really is. Okay, any questions on that? Now, we have the next slide. Plasma proteins. Again, I'm going to skip this slide. I want you to understand that anytime we have a chemical, we know that it belongs to that category. All right, even this. I'm going to skip this slide. Keep in mind, again, antibodies are what? Your globulins, and therefore they belong to the plasma category. That is the best way you're going to get it from page 641. And there's a slide that I need to go back to, and that is this one. Whenever you see this term, hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, Hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis is the production of blood cells. And we're not just talking about red blood cells, we're talking about all of them. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and even platelets. Notice the author says, pr process of producing formed elements. The formed elements are those of platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. Okay, now let's continue. Our next topic is going into red blood cells. Okay, now, we already know this part. Red blood cells are making up the majority of your formed elements. Now, what is a red blood cell made out of? A red blood cell is made out of a component called hemoglobin. Now, the slide says it's the red pigment it binds to oxygen and carbon dioxide. That's fine and dandy. But you need to understand that the heme portion is the iron. The globin portion is the protein. Okay, so let's say that again. The heme is the iron. The globin is the protein portion. Okay, that is important. That is why our blood is reddish in color and say Mr. Spock from Star Trek, he has a greenish blood because his metal pigment is copper instead of iron. Okay, so that's how it works as a comparison. So it's heme, therefore the reddish pigment caused by iron's oxidation. Now, next, remember I said male more, female less. We have red blood cell count in microliter. So in one microliter, how many red blood cells do we have? We're rounding this off to five million. So five million red blood cells per microliter. Again, men will have more, female will have less on average. Now I've already told you about hematocrit earlier. It is the percentage of red blood cells in whole blood. Our average number is about 45. Again, men will have more, female will have less. The structure of a red blood cell. This picture has no bearing, so we're going to continue. Now this picture is important, or this slide is important from this perspective down here. I'm going to be on number three now. Now in number three, it says 7.8 microns. I'm going to average that off to about eight. Now eight microns is the size, the diameter of a red blood cell. Why is that important? Because later in chapter 21, when we talk about blood vessels, we're going to find that the red blood cell's diameter is just enough for it to go through a capillary. So the diameter of a capillary is typically about the same as a red blood cell. Now what does that mean? It means that the red blood cell will be moving in a capillary in a single file manner. And that single file means that they're going to move slowly through the blood vessels. Okay, now 
The other thing we want to keep in mind is that the shape of the red blood cell and the hemoglobin is enabling it to carry a certain number of oxygen molecules. And we'll see that in a moment. Here's what a red blood cell smear would look like. So that's a red blood cell smear. Remember, red blood cells are reddish in color. They are biconcave. They are anucleated typically. So the mature ones are anucleated. They're biconcave and the diameter is eight microns. Now, when you have anucleated, that means that they've lost their nucleus. Here's another picture. So they're a biconcave donut shape. And they're, of course, made out of hemoglobin. So biconcave donut shape. Here's another picture. Remember I said that they're about eight microns in diameter. Now, this biconcave donut shape is holding about 280 million hemoglobin molecules. Let's say that again. So a red blood cell typically holds 280 million hemoglobins. That's a lot. So we have 280 million hemoglobins per red blood cell. We typically say that they're reddish when they have more oxygenation and they're typically bluish when they have less oxygenation. Now why more red? Because at, when they're more red, they're called oxyhemoglobin because we have more oxygen on them. So oxyhemoglobin means more oxygen on them. When we have more carbon dioxide on a red blood cell, it is called carboaminohemoglobin. So when we have more carbon dioxide, it's carboaminohemoglobin. Okay, next slide. Now, as I said earlier, red blood cells lack a nuclei, no mitochondria, no ribosomes. That means they are basically what? That's it. They're just living and they're anaerobic. Now, the lifespan of a red blood cell is about 120 days. The question should come into your mind as to why is it just 120 days? How does it know when the 120 days are up? When you have very sour milk because the milk has spoiled, we know that that's the case because of what? The expiration date. Well, how does a red blood cell know it's time to go? Well, first, the red blood cell knows because every cell of our body has a surface marker. And these surface markers are something you learned in 2401. They are your membrane proteins. And one of the functions of a membrane protein was cell ID. After 120 days, these membrane proteins dissolve. And when they dissolve, the immune system no longer considers them part of you, but rather foreign. So the macrophages, both from the spleen and the liver, will do what? Take them to these places and destroy the red blood cells after 120 days. We'll see that in a little while. So it's really important to understand that surface markers are very important in identifying who you are, even for red blood cells. Now we said that red blood cells are made out of hemoglobin. I told you that a red blood cell will typically have 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. How much in whole blood is the next question. Here we go. Normal hemoglobin is about 16, again I'm using a round number, 16 grams per deciliter. Notice we have the same rule again. Male has more, female has less. And if you know anything about the female reproductive, every month, menstruation, that's going to cause some of the blood loss. And that is why the female has a lower value than the male for all the numbers I have said so far. So. On average, we have 16 grams, of de 16 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin. So 16 grams of, 16 grams of 
hemoglobin per deciliter. Okay, next slide. Now, what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is a part protein. Now, what part is protein? It's the globin part that is protein. Each of these units has one molecule of heme, therefore it carries one molecule of iron. Now a hemoglobin fully made will actually have four hemes and four globin proteins. So four hemes, four globin proteins. Here's how it should look. So four hemes, four irons. Now what happens if a red blood cell's protein is distorted, such as in sickle cell anemia? In such a case, you're carrying less heme, and if you have less heme, you have less iron carrying capacity. And that's why people with sickle cell anemia typically tend to be sluggish, fatigued easily, and things like that. All right, so red blood cell shape does matter, and the shape is based upon the hemoglobin. So one last time, hemoglobin has four protein chains. Two of them are called alpha. So we have two alpha chains and two beta chains, a total of four. And each of these hemoglobins will carry four irons total. So each of the hemoglobins can carry four oxygens total. Now, four irons, four oxygens. What happens if I carry less iron? If I have less iron, I have less oxygen carrying capacity. All right, so less iron, less uh, oxygen carrying capacity. Makes sense. Next slide. These two terms I've already mentioned. When we have a lot of oxygen on a red blood cell, we typically call it oxyhemoglobin. And if oxygen is popping off, it becomes deoxyhemoglobin. And the term I gave you earlier, if I have a lot of carbon dioxide on it, it is carboamino hemoglobin. Okay, here's your slide. Earlier I showed you that we had two alpha chains, two beta chains. So here's beta 1, beta 2. Alpha 1, alpha 2. How many hemes do I see? 1, 2, 3, 4. So each hemoglobin has four peptide or protein chains, and it has four hemes. Therefore, four irons per hemoglobin, four oxygens per hemoglobin, max. Now, just so that you know, we at rest do not use all four of those, meaning that at rest, I only lose an oxygen off of, say, one out of four. So for every red blood cell, we said we had 280 million hemoglobins. For each hemoglobin, I'm only using one of them. So I have oxygen on one, oxygen on two, oxygen on three still remaining. So at rest, when I'm not exercising, the oxygens on one, two, and three will remain. And I will only use oxygen from one of these irons. So at rest, we're only using 25% of the oxygen. That is why when we start to exercise, we still have reserves of one, two, and three that we can rely on when we start heavy exercise. So at rest, we're only using a very small part of the oxygen. 25% is the typical number. So we do not use all the oxygen at one time. We only use 25% of the oxygen per hemoglobin and therefore roughly per red blood cell. Okay, I don't care for that slide. And now we're on this slide. I've already mentioned the key part. I already told you that with carbon dioxide is on an oxygen hemoglobin thing. So if, if we have a lot of carbon dioxide on hemoglobin, we call it carboamino hemoglobin. Okay. 
Okay, now we're on this slide. As I've said, macrophages of the liver, macrophages of the spleen, they are going to kill off the red blood cells roughly every 120 days. So a portion of our red blood cells are always being recycled and turned over. So the white blood cells will do that. Now, there is a problem with breaking down red blood cells. We've already learned that a hemoglobin has a globin portion and a heme portion. Now the globin portion, when you break down a red blood cell and you break down hemoglobin, the globin portion will be recycled. Notice it says the proteins will go back to amino acids and the bone marrow will reuse them to make more red blood cells. So that story is simple. However, heme is not. Heme is an iron. That iron molecule cannot be moving around the body on its own. It has to be processed. And what happens is that the heme is going to get converted to biliverdin. So it's a conversion that the liver typically does. It converts the heme to biliverdin. Now, these two slides, or these two things on the slide, are important. So please make sure you make a note of it. It's hemoglobinuria and hematouria. Make sure you make a note of those two. Now a moment ago, I told you about biliverdin. I said that the liver will play a role in that. Okay. Well, biliverdin is converted to bilirubin. This is done again by the liver. Now, bilirubin is toxic to the body. It needs to be removed from the body. If you do not remove bilirubin from the body, especially because of overflow in the liver, and it goes into your blood, it's going to end up turning your skin yellow, your eyeballs yellow, because you're going to have hepatitis. And a condition within hepatitis is called jaundice. And that's when your skin and your eyeballs turn yellowish. Okay? That's because you're overflowing the bilirubin from the liver. And bilirubin is toxic. So what do I need to do? I need to convert this bilirubin and somehow get it outside my body. The way I do that is either through urobilin, typically goes out into the urine, and stercobilin, which typically goes out of your poop, which is your digestive tract. This is also what gives your digestive poop its typical brownish color. So that yellow-brown color is coming from stercobilins. Okay. So that's how we get it out of the body. Now, in the process of making bilirubin and all of that, we have our heme. So we have to get rid of this heme, either through biliverdin, or we need to reprocess it. And again, as I said, iron is toxic if it's by itself. It needs to be transported and then bound to something properly. The way you do that is using these transport molecules for iron. I usually call them chaperones. So you cannot have iron-free floating. It has to be bound to something to prevent damage. So we have transferrin, which is a molecule that moves iron from place to place like a chaperone. And then we have these two that play a storage role in the iron. Again, iron cannot be free floating. It has to be bound to something. Now, to get a picture of all of this, we have this picture. The page number on this picture is page 647. That picture is definitely worth noting. So page 647 is worth noting. You'll see that the comments I gave you earlier is that when a red blood cell is ready to die after 120 days, most of it goes this way in terms of breaking it down. And notice here we have our heme, our iron. It goes into biliverdin, bilirubin, bilirubin, and then excreted as either urobilin, which goes through the kidney, 
or stercobilin, which goes into the poop, the poop, the feces. Okay, so stercobilin, feces, urobilin through the urine. And notice it says that some of the iron, of course, has to be recycled. And notice who's carrying it. Transferrin. You cannot have iron free floating. So transferrin will bring it back to the bone marrow where the iron heme will be remade and will make new red blood cells with the globin as well as heme. So this is now a new heme and a new globin to make a new red blood cell. Okay. So make sure you're comfortable with that slide. Okay. Okay. Draw a line in your notes. That's a stopping point. Before we continue with Chapter 19, Part 2, it is important that you've studied the following pictures. Page 640, page 641, page 644, page 645, and page 647. Now we'll continue with Chapter 19. On this slide, we see the term erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis is the production of red blood cells. Earlier, I had shown the term hemopoiesis, which is the making of all of the blood cell types. So don't confuse the two terms. So hemopoiesis is the production of red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. That's a general term. And erythropoiesis is specifically the red blood cells. Now where are red blood cells made? In the red bone marrow. Now, the tissue mentioned here is the myeloid type of tissue for red blood cells. Now, the red blood cells do have a nucleus while they're inside the bone marrow. However, before they go into the circulation, they become anucleated. So, mature red blood cells are anucleated. Next, we have this slide. Now, this slide is an important one because it goes to a picture later. The term we're starting with is hemocytoblast. It is the granddaddy or grandmother of all of the blood cell types. Now typically we have this first term here called myeloid stem cells. The next type we have are the lymphoid stem cells. You will see this in a better picture later. Your next slide is this one. I don't really care for this slide because I like the picture of a chart that we have later. Next slide for me is this one, regulation of erythropoiesis. Now we already know the two main components of red blood cells as part of hemoglobin is the protein or amino acid and the heme which is your iron. Now we do need vitamins, especially vitamin B12 and things like folic acid. For example, if you have pernicious anemia, you have a problem with red blood cell production. So you have low red blood cell count. And that's because you don't have enough vitamin B12. Now next, we have this term on the next slide, and that is erythropoietin. Now this is actually a hormone. This hormone plays a role in increasing the red blood cell production. Now, when would you, would you see this? You would see this in a disease state or when you are visiting Brad Pitt in Tibet at very high altitudes. Now, we have a term here called hypoxia, and that's often confused. The term hypoxia means not having enough oxygen at the tissue level. Now, do not confuse that with anemia. Now, anemia has two causes. The first cause is not having enough red blood cells to begin with. So if you don't have enough red blood cells, you're going to be anemic. But you can also be anemic even if you have enough red blood cells because, say, we don't carry enough oxygen per red blood cell. So we saw earlier that we have four hemes and therefore we have four irons and therefore we should have four oxygens. But if for some reason on a typical red blood cell or a typical hemoglobin 
we're not carrying enough oxygen, then we can be anemic as well. So anemia is because we don't have enough red blood cells or we don't have enough oxygen per red blood cell. And if we do that, we don't have enough, we might not have enough at the tissue level and that can lead to hypoxia. Okay, so be comfortable with the distinctions between those two terms, so anemia versus hypoxia. This chart is a summary of much of what we've said, so I've already given you the common numbers that go with these items. This slide is important. We've already gone over this slide as well. Then we come to blood typing. Now, as I've mentioned in my overview before for chapter 19, I said something about every cell of our body having a surface marker. Well, red blood cells are no different. They also have a surface marker. We also said that after 120 days, red blood cells are marked off for destruction. And we said that how does it know that? It knows it because the cells are now considered foreign. That surface marker antigen has eroded away, now causing it to go from being part of you to being foreign. And that's where your immune system comes in and destroys it. Now your blood typing is genetically determined. So you can have surface antigens A, B, or now we call it D, but it was called RH. So we either have A or we don't. We either have B or we don't. We either have A and B, or we don't have either A or B. Or we have H, or we don't have H, the RH, the D. So either we have it, or we don't. Here's the chart that says it best. So A blood is A blood because it has antigen A. B blood is B blood because it has antigen B. AB blood is because it has both antigens, A and B, and O has neither A nor B. Now here's the catch. O is considered the universal donor. Why is O a universal donor? Because it has no antigens with respect to A or B. And as you know, there, if there are no antigens, the immune system cannot respond to it. So neither A nor B. Now AB blood is a universal recipient. Now in this case, AB people, they have antigen A and B. But why is it AB a universal recipient? Because the other part of our story that we're about to see, AB people do not have antibodies against A or B. If you have no antibodies, you cannot react to any of the antigens, and that is why AB is considered universal recipient. Now having said that, let's go to the next slide. This slide says it best. Now this term, agglutinogen, is exclusive to chapter 19 blood. What does it really mean? Nothing more than antigen. So agglutinogen is nothing more than your antigen. Now, of course, Who's looking for it? Your immune system. And, of course, the antibodies are going to attack it. If they find a surface antigen that does not match properly, then we're going to have clumping, and that's called agglutinate or agglutination. So you have clumping of your blood, and that's not a good thing. So now, what is the other aspect. So if we have a glutinogen for your antigen, what's the other part? Your antibodies. Now not shown on this slide, but there's another term and that's called a glutenin. So the term a glutenin is the same as antibody. So one more time, a glutenin is the same as antibody. Now A blood has actually antibody B. B blood has antibody A. O blood has A and B antibodies, and AB blood has neither A nor B. This is also the reason to justify why O is a universal donor. 
owe people can give to anyone because of what? No antigens. However, because it has antibodies of A and B, it can only get from fellow O blood. That's not a problem because most of us in the room are actually what? O blood. O blood people are the majority. On the other hand, AB blood are the minority. It's a rare thing to have AB blood. But look what it says. It has neither A nor B antibodies. And that is why AB blood, even though they have antigen A and B, they're still a universal recipient because they have neither A nor B antibodies. Their blood is willing to take O, A, or B because they have no antibodies in there. Now remember the rule. Where will I find antibodies in whole blood? Antibodies or immunoglobins are found in the plasma. Again, don't forget the, the, the golden rule or the general rule that if it is a chemical, it belongs in the plasma. If it is a cell, it belongs in the formed elements. Again, don't forget that rule. Make sure you study this picture. This picture is found on page 651, so make sure you study this picture. It is what we've said thus far. So if I'm in type A blood, type A blood will have surface markers for A, but it will have antibodies for B. A type B blood person would have surface antigen B, but antibodies against A. And if I move on to AB blood on the next slide, AB blood has surface markers of A and B, but no plasma antibodies. That's why they are a universal recipient. On the other hand, O lacks surface markers. So they can give this red blood cell here to anyone because they're a universal donor. They lack the surface antigens. However, O blood can only get from a fellow O because they have antibodies against A and B. The next kind of factor that we have, another type of antigen, is the D antigen or the RH antigen. Now why are they calling it RH? Because they got it first studied in a rhesus monkey. So since it was first studied in a rhesus monkey, we call it RH and now it's called D antigen. Now when it comes to D or RH, you either have it or you don't. So your red blood cell either has a RH positive or an RH negative. That's it. Now when does this come into play? The RH factor comes into play when there is a delivery of the child. Now look what the author says. Problems seldom develop during the first pregnancy. Here's why. Now, let's say that the mom is RH negative. And by the way, this issue will only come up when the mom is RH negative. If the mother is RH positive, this story does not occur. Okay, so the mother has to be RH positive, excuse me, the mother has to be RH negative for this problem to even develop. And if the mother is RH positive, this story will not happen. Now what story are we talking about? It's called the hemolytic disease of the newborn. The other name you're likely to see on a test, instead of saying hemolytic disease of the newborn, is erythroblastosis fetalis. So erythroblastosis fetalis is the same as hemolytic disease of the newborn. And one more time before I go forward, it only occurs when the RH mother is negative. So the RH negative mother. Now, what will happen in the first pregnancy? If the baby of the first pregnancy is RH positive, this story will come about. Now, nothing will happen to that first child. So this first fetus will come out everything will be fine. 
What happens, however, is that we set up the problem for the second fetus. Now, here's how it works. When the first fetus came out, and the first fetus was Rh positive, when it came out during the delivery process in the placenta region, notice that the author is showing you a placenta, in the placenta region, at the time of delivery, we had this happen hemorrhaging at delivery. So at the time of delivery, the first fetus, its Rh positive blood mingled with the blood of the Rh negative mom. When that mingling happens, the mother is forced to produce antibodies against this Rh positive blood. Now, once the mom makes antibodies against this Rh positive blood, and when the second fetus story comes around, the mom has already made what? Antibodies against Rh positive. And that is likely to cause a damage to the second issue. So here's the story showing you that the mom has made the maternal antibodies against Rh positive. And if that was to allow to continue, notice now what will happen. You're going to have lysis or hemolysis of the blood. So the second fetus will now have a problem if the second fetus is also Rh positive. If the second fetus is Rh negative, nothing happens to the second fetus. It's only when the subsequent one happens to be Rh positive. So if the third fetus happened to be Rh positive after the second one was Rh negative and nothing was done, then that third fetus, which is now Rh positive, would have a problem. So of course, it's the first fetus that sets up the problem for future children. Okay. Now, how can I prevent this? Well, I can prevent this by giving the mom what's called Rogam, R-H-O-G-A-M, Rogam. Giving the mom Rogam at the end of the first pregnancy, closer to the very end, and it's also given after the first fetus is delivered. So when the first baby pops out, the mom is given Rogam, R-H-O-G-A-M. What is it? It is basically antibodies given to the mom in advance. What does it do? It clears out any of the baby's Rh blood that has happened to go into the mom. So it clears out all of the Rh positive blood from the fetus. That way the mom never makes any antibodies against it. Now, it is a routine process to do this. So in the hospital, after the first baby pops out, they give the mom Rogam. It cleans out the mom's system of Rh positive blood from the fetus, and that prevents any setup for the second child, especially if the second child is also Rh positive. So each pregnancy, we give the mom Rogam after the delivery. And that way we prevent any formation of antibodies against the Rh positive. Now had the mom been Rh positive, then it doesn't matter. That story of hemolytic disease of the newborn will not happen. Because if the mom is Rh positive, nothing will happen. It does not matter whether the baby is Rh positive, Rh negative we'll never run into this problem. It's only when the mom is negative and the fetus is positive that we set up the problem for this. Now, this slide on transfusion, remember the word agglutination, it's the clumping. So it's always important to double check the blood type. Here's what happens when you have agglutination. Agglutination causes the clumping of the blood and eventually it bursts the red blood cells. So you first get clumping if you have the wrong kind of blood in you and then hemolysis, it breaks it down. 
The next picture that I'm going to go over is this blood typing. Here we have type A blood put into each of these wells. So type A blood is put in each one of these wells. What you see is antibody added to it. Since it clumped up right here, it says that I must have what? Since I'm type A blood, I must have A antigen. If I have A antigen and I'm adding anti-A, it's going to clump. If I have A blood here and I add anti-B, it's not going to clump. And since it's positive and I add type A blood here and it clumps, I know by adding anti-D, it's going to be positive. Same as here. Now let's go to the very bottom because I want to show you how that works. At the very bottom, we have O blood. I have O, O, O blood added to each one of these three wells. I add anti-A, but remember, O blood has no antigen. So no antigen A, no clumping. Over here, O blood has no antigen B. Therefore, when I add antibody B, no clumping. And since it's negative, when I add O blood here and it's anti-D, no clumping, which tells me that this person is definitely O negative. So this is what you do to do a blood typing. Very quick, very simple. So these are the antibodies at the top, and these are the blood types along with their respective antigens. I really don't care for this chart, but I just want to let you know that there's more O out there and there's a whole lot less AB out there. Right. So a whole lot less AB and a whole lot more O. Okay. Next, we move to white blood cells. Now for white blood cells, white blood cells are called leukocytes. They do not carry oxygen, so they don't have any hemoglobin. Now, what do they do? The functions for white blood cells are listed below there. They defend against pathogens, they remove toxins and waste from the body, and they attack any abnormal cells, such as cancer cells, for example. Okay. Now, when it comes to white blood cells, I do want you to know a rough range. I'll show you a chart on that in a moment. So I do want you to know the rough range. On this slide, the most important thing about this is that white blood cells can do what? They can migrate out of the bloodstream. So they can actually sort of push their way out of the bloodstream and go into the interstitial fluid. Why is that? Because where do you think the germ is going to go? The germ is going to go out of your bloodstream and into the extracellular fluid space so your white blood cells have the same ability. They can leave the bloodstream and go to the extracellular fluid space to kill the germ. Now, how do I recognize a germ? I recognize a germ by the chemical stimuli and that's called positive chemotaxis. So germs leave a footprint and I am attracted to that footprint as a white blood cell, and I go after that germ. Typically, footprints are either the chemicals that the germ releases or the lining of the germ, like an antigen, for example. So positive chemotaxis is the attraction to that foreign germ. The ones down here are the phagocytic ones, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes. This list right here is a list of the typical white blood cells. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. I'm now going to briefly go through each of them. The neutrophils are the most plentiful. They are the ones often first on the scene of an infection. So neutrophils, often first on the scene of an infection, and we have many of them. So of all of these, neutrophils tend to be the highest. 
I'll show you a chart on that in a moment. So neutrophils have the highest number count. Now neutrophils are called neutrophils because when you dye them, as in stain them, the pH of that dye, that stain, is neutral, pH 7. Then we have eosinophil. Now eosinophils are named because their dye or their stain is acidic. So it's an acidic dye that actually stains them or dyes them. Now eosinophil is going to go with parasites for us. So to make it clear for a test purpose, eosinophil will be a parasitic issue. Then we have basophils. Basophils are stained with a dye that is a pH of a basic dye. Now, the, the basophils are primarily for allergic reactions. Okay. Now, the ones I've just done, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, they're collectively called granulocytes. And when I show you the picture, you'll see why. So they look like little grains in them, so they're called granulocytes. The last two down here, monocytes and lymphocytes, those two are agranulocytes because you do not see those little dots in them. So they're agranulocytes. Now, what does a monocyte look like and how am I going to tell the difference between monocyte and lymphocytes? Monocytes are going to produce macrophages. So monocytes will later be shown as macrophages in chapter 22 on the immune system. So monocytes produce macrophages. Now, monocytes look very similar to lymphocytes. How will I know the difference? Well, monocytes typically look like a little band. So they often look like a little kidney bean because they look banded. Okay? They look like a little kidney bean, a little indentation there. So monocytes will have that indentation. Lymphocytes do not. Now let's look at the picture of those. Here we have the picture. Here's a lymphocyte, multi-banded. Here's eosinophil. Notice it's a reddish color. Basophil, again, lobed like this. More of a grayish color. And then here are the monocytes and the lymphocytes. Now earlier I said that monocytes look like a little kidney bean. They have a little indentation. That's the best way to tell a monocyte and tell the difference between a lymphocyte. So the kidney bean shape goes to monocyte. Okay, next slide. We have neutrophil here. Okay. Now neutrophils, remember I said, big chunk, 50 to 70 percent of the circulating white blood cells. Do keep in mind that they have enzymes, but that sort of makes sense from 2401. They have something that's going to kill off the germ. So that's neutrophil. Again, the most plentiful. Okay. This slide, don't care too much about it, but I do want you to know these two terms at the, excuse me, at the bottom, these two terms. So prostaglandins and leukotrienes. But be aware of these two terms. This slide, don't care for, we already saw it. And now we move to eosinophils. Notice again the percentage is far less in comparison to neutrophils. We have this acid story I've already mentioned and look what it says here. Attacks large parasites. Now down here it says are sensitive to allergens. I don't want you to write that. That will cause issues with a test. So what are you going to remember for test purposes? Eosinophils deal with parasites. Eosino eosinophils deal with parasites. And we've already seen this picture. Then we have basophils. Again, notice the percentage roughly. Now this time I do want you to know this. Basophils go with histamines. And what do histamines do? They dilate the blood vessels. Now this is where you take Benadryl for antihistamine. And if you notice, Benadryl antihistamine goes with allergies. So basophil, histamine, allergies. And that is why if you have a lot of basophil count going up, 
you're allergic to something, and that is your sign that you have histamine release. Okay, next slide. Monocytes. Now, monocytes shown here, the information down here is too vague. I want you to understand that monocytes are your nonspecific. So monocytes or macrophages, so monocytes, macrophages. Here's your line, monocytes, macrophages, and they deal with nonspecific issues, nonspecific issues. We've already seen this picture. Now we have lymphocytes. Again, notice much larger, right? Much larger, bigger chunk there. They are the ones that go in and out of the blood easily. And this time around, notice the language for lymphocytes. They are specific. So let me make sure we're together. Monocytes are nonspecific. Lymphocytes are specific. That's important. Okay, next page, next slide. This is now a part of lymphocytes. So we have T cells. For right now, in this chapter, I want you to know what you see on the slide. T cells go with cell-mediated immunity. And as I said a moment ago, since it's a lymphocyte, T cells, cell mediated immunity is specific immunity. Okay. Moving to the next slide, we have B cells. Again, we're still talking about lymphocytes. Now, B cell is called humoral immunity. What do B cells produce? They turn into plasma cells. So, B cells turn into plasma cells. And these plasma cells will then make specific antibodies. So B cells turn into plasma cells and they make specific antibodies. The last one is NK cells. As you see here, they deal with cancers and that's all I care for for this test. So B cells, plasma cells, antibodies, and then the NK dealing with cancers. Okay, next slide. White blood cells. Differential count. Why is it important to do a differential count? A differential count will let you know what's going on with your body in terms of an infection. Now on page 657, the top right hand corner has a section titled as we see here, differential count and changes in white blood cells. That right-hand corner at the top talks about a differential count. Why would I do one? Because I need to know the difference between an infection, an inflammation, and an allergic response. So if we have neutrophils going up, we know that we have an infection to fight off somewhere in the body. If we have basophils going up, then we know it's not an infection, but rather an allergic reaction. And if we have inflammation, it might be eosinophil because we have some kind of parasitic infection somewhere in our body. So a differential count gives us that type of information. Okay, next slide. We have disorders. We have leukopenia, when you have a low white blood cell count. Leukocytosis, when we have a high white blood cell count. And then we have leukemia. Now, how am I going to know the difference between leukocytosis, which is high white blood cell count, and leukemia, which is also high white blood cell count? Well, the difference is this. In leukemia, the cells, these white blood cells, not only do we have a high count, but they are deformed. So the white blood cells look different. They act different. Remember the rule in anatomy and physiology, changing the structure, changes the function. So by having a leukemia, you have a different type. So when you say blood cancer, they typically are referring to leukemia, which is an alteration in the white blood cell. So white blood cells actually look deformed. Okay, next slide. 
Now this slide, don't care too much about. I do care for this slide that I'm putting up next, this slide. I do want you to be aware of that range. Remember we said 50 to 70, mostly for neutrophils, differential count, less for eosinophils, basophils. Have a general feel for this column. Next, we already know the shape, so I'm going to go with this and I'm not going to care too much about that. And of course, you already need to know the functions. And notice the author says it nicely. Parasitic will go with eosinophil. And when it comes to histamines, it'll go with basophils. Do keep this one last paragraph in mind here about mast cells. So mast cells, histamine, basophils. Next slide. We have monocytes, lymphocytes. Their functions are mentioned here. And again, keep in mind that we have more lymphocytes, less monocytes. What are monocytes? Not specific. What are lymphocytes? Specific. And the author says it right there. Okay. Now, this is the slide that I've been waiting to explain. This slide is on page 659. So page 659. On this page, you see a bone marrow and you see the grandmother, grandfather of all the blood cell types called hemocytoblast. So we've already talked about that before. It's the granddaddy, grandmother of all the blood cell types. We also saw in a previous slide that we broke it down to myeloid and lymphoid. So myeloid and lymphoid. The myeloid ones are going to break down this way. This first path, and you can see this EPO. The EPO is erythropoietin, a hormone that actually stimulates the production of red blood cells, and we already saw that. Now, I do want you to know for test purposes that it's a proerythroblast giving rise to red blood cells. So proerythroblast will give rise to red blood cells. And notice mature red blood cells are anucleated. And it shows it right there where the nucleus is removed. So anucleated. Then we have this column here. And it's called megakaryocyte. A megakaryocyte produces thrombocytes. So megakaryocyte produces thrombocytes, which produces the platelets. And we'll see more on that in a moment. Then we have this line right here. So this is now your myeloblast. And if you remember, myeloblast will give rise to basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. Basically who? The granulocytes. So myeloblast will go with granulocytes. Then we have monoblast. The name is easy. Monoblast will give rise to monocyte. Then the lymphoid has a separate pattern, and the lymphoblast will give rise to lymphocytes, both the T lymphocyte and the B lymphocyte that we already saw. So make sure you're comfortable with the concept that I just mentioned. Draw a line. We now go to the next section. The next section is called hemostasis. So the next section is called hemostasis. So the next section is hemostasis. Now there's an aspect of hemostasis I need to mention first. So let's backtrack for a second. Now, hemostasis is the cessation of bleeding or the stoppage of bleeding. In order for us to have stoppage of bleeding, I need to have platelet production. So hemostasis, stoppage of bleeding, is going to deal with platelets. So let me move over to platelets and then come back to this slide. So we have platelets. Now, earlier I said that we have megakaryocytes producing 
thrombocytes. Thrombocytes will in turn produce the platelets. Okay. Will in turn produce the platelets. Now, next slide. Have this slide down. Thrombocytopenia refers to low platelet count and thrombocytosis refers to a high platelet count. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so be aware of this slide before I move forward. Now, what do platelets do? This slide is important. They release clotting chemicals, and we'll see that in a moment. They produce clotting chemicals. They fix walls, and they reduce the size of a break in a wall, so they make the size smaller. So they're pretty much patchwork. So if you want to consider platelets to be a patchwork, that's exactly what platelets are. We've already talked about this slide, so I'm going to skip this one. Don't care for that one. Now this slide is important. Now we have platelets here. Go all the way over to the function and do you see the word that I'm now on? Hemostasis. And that is why I backtracked to this slide. Hemostasis. So we're going to look at that term next. Hemostasis. It's the stoppage of bleeding. And this is the slide that I am now coming back to. So hemostasis, stoppage of bleeding. It has three main phases. We're going to write these down and we'll move forward. We have vascular phase. And during the vascular phase, the blood vessel is going to squeeze more. It's going to pump more. And why would you want to do that? Because if you have an injury, you're wanting to bring all of your clotting materials, your white blood cells there, because we want to have all the materials to fix the problem there. So we want to have a, a greater blood flow for a time being. And once we get all the items there, we're then going to do what? Shut down the blood flow. It's almost like if you have a germ somewhere, what do you want to do to that germ? You don't want it to spread, so we want to quarantine it. And so first we are going to improve blood flow so that we can get all our stuff there. All our clotting stuff, white blood cells, things like that. Once we have them there, we want to narrow and isolate or quarantine that area. And that's what's going to happen in the vascular phase. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to that slide. In the vascular phase, we see these things happening. Again, I've already summarized it. Continuing, again, it talks about these things. We're doing what? We're just sealing the off the blood flow. And isn't that what I said a moment ago? Our job, once we have everything there, is to seal off the blood flow. So in vascular spasm, our job after we get everything there is to seal it off. And this slide says it best. Here's your vascular spasm. We're doing what? Narrowing off and we're going to narrow the blood vessel, pretty much cutting down the blood flow there. Okay. So that way the germs can't go anywhere. The bleeding stops too. Okay. So we're going to cut down on the movement of the germs. We're going to cut down on the movement of blood flow. That's the best thing. Now, when you get injured, what do they often say? Ice first, then heat. Same reasoning. What are we doing with the ice? We're slowing down the blood flow to that region. And then why heat afterwards? We're trying to improve the blood flow after that area has been fixed, has healed. Okay, now I'm moving to the second phase of hemostasis, which is platelet phase. Now, I would take platelet phase and break it down into three Roman numerals. The first Roman numeral under platelet phase is platelet adhesion, where a platelet will actually stick to the walls of your blood vessel because that blood vessel is damaged. So platelet adhesion is Roman numeral one under platelet phase. 
So the platelets are sticking to the walls of the damaged blood vessel. Now to me, a platelet is like a piece of glitter, a little glitter piece that's sticking to the wall of the damaged blood vessel. Then the next thing that happens is platelet aggregation. That is Roman numeral two under platelet phase. Platelet aggregation is when other platelets are recruited to stick to each other. Now you should know by now, how do I tell one platelet to stick to another platelet? It must be a chemical message. So one platelet is telling another platelet, hey, I'm sticking to the wall. If you stick to me and more stick to us, then we can have a big, nice seal. So platelet aggregation is going to be a chemical process. We'll see that in a second. Our final phase of Roman numeral three now is platelet plug, where we're actually having formed a plug there. Now, a moment ago, I told you that chemicals are needed in this platelet aggregation. This list is a list of chemicals that play a role in that platelet aggregation process where it tells other platelets, you need to stick to me, you need to stick to me, and that's how it works. Now, the ones that are more important to me are item number two, thromboxane A2, and number four, platelet-derived growth factor. Those are the two very important ones. So thromboxane A2 and platelet-derived growth factor. Now, number five, calcium ions, will also play a role in blood clotting. And we'll see that in the next picture. Okay, so that's important from that point of view. Okay, now the next slide. Factors that limit the growth of the platelet plug. Just as we want to have a plug form, we also have to limit how much of a plug forms. Otherwise, a nice, big, huge blood clot will be there. All right, so we don't want that blood clot growing and growing and growing forevermore. So there is a limiting process. And this first term up here is going to limit how big that platelet aggregation process will get. Okay. So it's the limiting chemical. Okay, next slide. Now, this is a slide summarizing step two. So this is a slide that summarizes step two, the platelet phase. This is a slide that has Roman numeral one, two, and three built in. So here we see a hole in the blood vessel, and we see platelets sticking. And once the platelets were sticking, then we had platelet aggregation. And now the circle shows that once we have Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three, we're going to have a platelet plug form. And that's what we're looking at, platelet plug forming. We gotta make sure that that plug stays there. So that's gonna be the next. And now we go to number three. Now, this is not Roman, Roman numeral three or anything like that. Remember, hemostasis had three main phases. So let me backtrack for a second. We had vascular phase, which we looked at. We had platelet phase that we looked at. And the platelet had Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. Now we have a big main phase by itself called coagulation. So once we have this clot right here form, this plug form, we need to wrap it up. We need to make sure it stays there. Otherwise it'll just peel off. So coagulation phase is your true blood clotting. So coagulation phase is your true blood clotting. Now, it does require enzymes. And what you're going to find is this word, fibrinogen. If you recall from the earlier part of the chapter that fibrinogen played a role in blood clotting, and it was found in the plasma portion of our blood. Well, fibrinogen is a soluble liquid. So it's soluble. Fibrinogen is soluble. It turns into fibrin 
which is insoluble. So it turns into fibrin, which is insoluble. This fibrin very much looks like Spider-Man's web, a mesh. And what will that fibrin mesh do? It'll hold the platelet plug in place. That's the in intention behind this phase. So it's going to hold that clot in position. So it's going to hold that clot in position. Now, of course, I'm going to need something to make that happen. I'm going to need clotting factors. We see 12 or 13 of them here. So we see clotting factors. So in order for this coagulation to occur, I'm going to need clotting factors. On this slide, which has all of these 13 mentioned, Factor 8 is the one I want you to play attention to. So factor 8, and why factor 8? Because it's the hemophiliac factor. So someone that has hemophilia has a problem with factor 8. Okay, that is important. So that's factor 8 for hemophilia. Now these clotting factors are actually produced in the intestine with the help of vitamin K. So in the intestine, and when I say intestine, I'm really talking about large intestine. So in the large intestine, bacteria help produce vitamin K. And much of what you see here as clotting factors are made because of vitamin K. You'll see it listed here. Requires vitamin K. Requires vitamin K. Requires vitamin K requires vitamin K. So many of these require vitamin K to produce them as clotting factors. Now, when it comes to a coagulation, you have three possible pathways. The extrinsic, the intrinsic, and the common. Now, extrinsic has to do with the blood vessel wall damage. So extrinsic deals with the blood vessel wall damage. Intrinsic deals with the chemicals and some issue with the chemicals within the blood. Okay, within the blood. And then both of these fall into the common pathway. Now the best thing to do to understand that is instead of going over these slides, the best one is to go over this picture. So we're going to look at the left side first, which is extrinsic. In extrinsic, the damage of your blood vessel, so the damaged blood vessel is initiating this. So the extrinsic is a damage to the blood vessel, damage to the tissue. It releases tissue factors. Calcium plays a role in that. Then we have clotting factors, and they go into factor 10. So the common link will be factor 10. Now, when we have intrinsic, in the case of intrinsic, we're dealing with this storyline, where we have some chemicals within the blood having an effect. Again, calcium plays a role, and they again lead to who? Factor 10. So factor 10 is the starting point for the common pathway. What happens next? Well, factor 10 produces an enzyme called prothrombinase. Prothrombinase is an enzyme that converts prothrombin to thrombin. Now, do you see a cascading effect here? So prothrombinase helps prothrombin turn into thrombin. Thrombin, in turn, converts fibrinogen into fibrin. And now you can see in the illustration these little webs being formed. And you see it on the inset as well. So in the inset, you see these little white, reddish spider webs. And those spider webs keep everything trapped together. Okay. So factor 10, prothrombinase, prothrombin, thrombin, fibrinogen, fibrin. Now, this cascading effect here is what the doctors check when they do what's called a PTT. 
prothrombinase time. And what that prothrombinase time does is checks how long does it take for your blood to clot. So when you give blood samples at the doctor's office, they're going to monitor how long it takes for your blood to clot. And that's called PTT, prothrombinase time, or prothrombin time. Okay, any questions on that one? Let's move on. Okay, uh, keep in mind that blood clotting is what? A positive feedback. You may have learned that in 2401. That blood clotting is a positive feedback. Next slide. Here we have feedback control. So these are the things that control it. Now on this slide, I want you to know the following. Now this slide is found on page four, sorry, six, six sixty-four. So page six sixty-four has this slide. Now on this slide, you see heparin. Aspirin, and that's why I take an aspirin a day to keep the doctor away. Aspirin, protein C. Make sure you're way aware of these. Now, another name for heparin is often warfarin, and some people call it coumadin. So these are all examples that fall under this category. So we have heparin, warfarin, coumadin, aspirin. Now, all of these work slightly different, and on page 664, you'll read the difference in how they operate. Next slide. Calcium ions, vitamin K, and blood clotting. And we've already mentioned this slide. So calcium ions play a role, vitamin K, because vitamin K help make clotting factors. Now, in addition to making clots, you have to have a way to break down clots. So in addition to making clots, you have to have a way to break down clots. Breaking a clot down is called fibrinolysis. So breaking a clot down is called fibrinolysis. Now the key one that's very, very important to us is this one here. Tissue plasminogen activator. Now why is that important? If you have a heart attack, you want to have that in you within an hour or two so that the damage done by that blood clot in the heart becomes less. How? Because you're able to dissolve the clot on the way to the hospital or soon upon getting to the hospital. And the quicker you are able to break down that clot, the quicker you're able to get more tissue nourished and therefore less of your heart is permanently damaged. Okay. So tissue plasminogen activator is a very important thing to give a heart patient who is undergoing a heart attack. Okay, that takes care of chapter 19. Make sure you review this video to help you with the chapter.